All right, let's get started. And welcome. Good to be back in the after church. It's been, how long has it been since we've had after church? A couple of, uh, three weeks that long. Okay. All right, well, let's get started. I hope that you've built some questions up, and I'll explain why after we pray. So let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing. Heavenly Father, as we um, <clears throat> spend this time going a little bit deeper into perhaps this lesson, uh, the text that we have before us, the the, the, the text that it surrounds it, and uh, oh, just, just in general, many of the things that we have studied over the last several weeks, Lord, we ask that you would bring to our attention, to our remembrance, the things that um, people want to talk about, and that it would be an edifying conversation. And it can only be edifying if it's glorifying to you, so we ask for both of those things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, I was in a situation, okay, I'll call you, but I was going to tell you, I was in a situation here where I was loading up things for the after church. It was going to be one of those sermons where it's like, okay, I, I can't cover this, so we're going to cover it in the after church, I can't cover that, and finally you just got too much, so I finally had to split the sermon, um, and, and that happens regularly when I sit down and write it, and it's, it, the, 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 the parable of the two servants should be preached together. It should not be separated. It should be one message. And so I fought and fought and fought to try to keep it at one. But whenever I start going over an hour and a half, um, I, I realize I probably would lose you. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I split it. And that was after already splitting off verses 46 through 48, 46, 47, and 48, which are actually the end of this paragraph. So whether or not we'll get to that and the profound statement of to the one who much is given, much will be required, um, that is uh, whether or not we get to that next week or not, we'll have to see. But anyway, um, questions about it, just about anything. Well, I, have, I just want to clarify my um, probably the misunderstanding that I have about what he said about if this church got really, really big, then, then I kind of... We phased out. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad that you know that if you disagree with me, that is an error on your part. Uh, okay, I, I'm, I'm glad that you started out establishing th that. Uh, no, <laughs> the, um, the what I was saying, and uh, I mean, we could have an entire dissertation on this um, discussion about a small church versus mega churches. And what was the intention of the church, and, and how should it be? Um, all I can do is look at it from a small church point of view, because we're a small church, and I'm a small church pastor. Um, I, I, there are mega churches that are wonderful churches, like uh, John MacArthur's church in California, that are just fantastic, and they really benefit from their numbers. But what I was saying there is if... At this church, we have certain things that the Lord has given us to do. One, one of those things is our body ministry. What, one of those things is the nurturing of each other and the closeness uh, of, each, uh, of being a, a, a church where, you, you know, I know your problems, another person, I know their problems, uh, and, and we minister to each other. We also have always been a healing church, a church where the Lord sends people to be healed, uh, and the, he may move them on. They go someplace else. You've probably seen it. You've been here very long, almost like a steady stream of people that the Lord, whose lives are totally d disasters, and they come here to be healed, but this is not their final destination. So those are some of the things that the Lord has given us to do. Well, what happens if all of a sudden we're packed to the, to the gills? We're not prepared. We're not, we're not geared for that. So what would happen is that you'd have an awful lot of people who would then not be um, ministered to as they should, as opposed to a very slow growth being a small church with more people. That's all I would say, is that, that unfortunately, the, the understanding of success in churches is size, is the number of people who go there. And that is ingrained in us, and it's ingrained in all of us to where... You know, people will come in here all the time and see empty pews, and they say, well, why, you know, how come you're not out there beating the bushes trying to bring people in? I can barely care for the people who are here, much less bringing more people in, you know? So um, there has to be an infrastructure there. 
that, that, the, that the Lord puts together. So that's all I meant. It, 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 I have nothing against filling the church. I, I, I wish that our ministry would be larger, that, that we could reach more people. You know, I, 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 I would wish for that too. But I, it's not an end in and of itself. It, it's, and I've told this story many times. I've probably told it to, to this group. Um, probably a year after I was called here to be pastor, I was sitting right over there um, one afternoon in the dark, in, in the, the sanctuary, praying, asking the Lord's direction. And I was praying because I needed, we had two services at that time. So now we have one service with a lot of empty pews. Then we had two services with a whole bunch of empty pews. So I was praying at the time, Lord, show me how to fill this church to your glory, of course. And it was just like somebody walked by and hit me in the face with a two by four and said, you're not taking care of the ones I've given you. What makes you think I'm going to send any more? You know, start taking care of the ones that I've given you first. And then maybe we'll bring more. You, you see, that's to, that completely changed my idea of, of what, as a church, what we're supposed to do. It is I, we, we, we need to be a church that people, that ministers to the needs of each other. Do we do it perfectly? No, of course not. No church does. But it's far more our, our focus than to create an environment that's going to bring a bunch of people in. So that that that's that's kind of the, the the mindset that I was I was speaking of. Yes, ma'am, Miss Rosanna. Uh, it's a little hard time to making the connection between us being slaves, but also being manager of the house. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, the, uh, the 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 parable that Jesus is teaching is of a slave who has. Tremendous autonomy within his boundaries. Okay, a, a man has a very large household, 20, 30 servants, put it that way. And the, the householder, the steward, the one who is in charge of all those servants is himself a slave. Okay, so he's not hired, he's not getting paid, he's not going to line his own pocket. Everything he does is for the benefit and the glory of his master. And that is the relationship that we have completely lost in today's world. Because we don't, you know, the idea of slavery is one so heinous to us from person to person that we, we, we kind of try to act like it never happened. Or if there was slavery in the Bible, it was a different kind of slavery. No, I'm sorry. It was out and out slavery. You know, go tell the children of Israel whose babies were being thrown into the Nile River, that it wasn't racial slavery. It was. They wanted to get rid of them. So we, we, we take the whole idea of master-slave out, but you cannot go through the Gospels especially and remove that because it's important that we recognize that our relationship with our master is one of zero ownership. We own nothing. And, and the Greeks... The definition of a slave to the Greeks was someone who had no self-determination. In other words, they, they almost, uh, a, a slave was just above an animal, so I'm, to put it frankly, uh, in the Greek mindset. Um, it, was, it was, they were people who had no self-determination, and to the Greeks that was everything. To be able to get up in the morning and go do what you want to do. I determine my own activities. If you don't have that, if that has been robbed from you, then you're less of a human being than someone who has that. And so the, uh, the idea that we're in charge of our own lives and we decide where we're going to go is not a New Testament biblical idea. It's that we are... We're slaves because God determines where we're going to go. He's the one that orchestrates. And the more we know that, the better we know that, the more uh, uh, in line we are with his will for us. Does that make sense? Does, do, do, does that show the distinction that, that, yes, a person can be a manager of other slaves, but that relationship, Rosanna, is what is so hugely significant here, is that when Jesus tells his story, he doesn't say, okay, who is the faithful manager 
who is making this house run efficiently? Who's the faithful manager who is uh, showing a profit at the end of the day? He says, who's the faithful manager taking care of my servants, my slaves? I own them, okay? And I've put you in charge over my slaves. So my faithful servant, you're a slave, but you're my faithful leader because you are focused on and taking care of these possessions of mine. We are his possessions. I mean, that is much closer to the understanding of our relationship with our Lord than is my own free will, which dominates the evangelical thought today. But that's not, that's not this. Okay. Does, that, does that make sense? Does that answer the question? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Off subject, sort of. We don't know um, else. <laughs> um, in reading the Bible, like, I had a presentation last week where they suggested reading scripture and what jumps out of the page at you. What strikes you? That kind of interpretation of the Bible. Is there a place for that? I know context is everything. Right. But is, is there a place for that kind of thing? Uh, let me uh, see if I understand what you're, you're talking about. Um, the... Let me, let me try to put it in different terms. Okay, on the one hand, there is that phrase that drives Reformed scholars crazy. Well, that's what the Bible means to me. Okay, that's what it says to me. Um, and, and so it speaks to me, all right? Um, the Bible will never speak to you something other than what it means. Okay, the Holy Spirit will never allow you to take a, 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 a verse to justify or to speak to you directly in a way that is not the intent of Scripture. If you read the Scripture and something jumps off the page at you and it is totally opposed to biblical teaching, then it didn't come from the Holy Spirit. Okay? And, and unfortunately, you hear it all the time. And I hear it as a pastor much more. Well, I was reading this passage, and the Lord just told me that, yes, it's okay for me to move in with my boyfriend because he wants me to be happy. Okay? And, it, and, and, and they'll cite a verse that the Lord spoke to me through this verse. Well, no, the Lord didn't speak to you through that verse. Now, that's one extreme. But I think what you're talking about is, is it possible to be reading Scripture and have the Holy Spirit in the context and spirit of that text speak directly to your heart to illuminate that text in a certain way to you that, is, that associates with something you might be going through. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Thing happening? I think that if you start telling little ones that, it's very dangerous. It's very dangerous for them because they don't have the spiritual discernment to know the difference. And you're going to end up with some teenagers who say, this justifies what I want to be or what I want to do. Okay? So I think that's a very dangerous thing to be teaching little ones. I think that what you teach little ones should be more age appropriate than, than that. But you, because that's, that's spiritual discernment to know. Um, okay. And the way you know is what you said. Take it in context. Right? If, if, if you think that the Holy Spirit has spoken something to you, then, all right, read the verses around it, read the chapter, read the book, and then make your decision. You know what I mean? So, yes, sir. Yeah, I have two things I want to say. I only one at a time. Okay, well, I, I, I combine them together. So, um, we were talking about servanthood and being slaves. Then when Jesus... Not even to trade the ultimate servanthood example he gave when he washed the disciples' feet. Right. And even the one that betrayed him, he, he, you know, he still put that in, in, in uh, spoke. So that was for being an example of how they should do toward one another. But then, like with myself, coming out of the churches that we came out of, seeing the ministers, how they was treated and all, and, and their wives. 
So when I first came, we first came, when I first came, and to get it done, and I'm seeing you ser serving, it made a difference in in what, and that's why I've been here for for, for for twelve years. So, so, so in other words, because you love my spaghetti sauce. Sorry. It's just an idea that you know when you see this, but then it, it take everything takes on the way you lead, and that's how this congregation is. The, 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 love, the love that they show one toward another is because of the example that you show. You know, and, and that's and that's to me that's leadership, and that's and that's how it's supposed to be. But like when you was talking, you were teaching this morning about a slave and then the leadership and the servanthood. Yeah, you know what Jesus gave the when I was sitting on listening, I'm like when Jesus gave the ultimate ultimate uh, example. Well, love you yeah. and being a servant. Absolutely. 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 And, and since that was such a nice thing to say, I'll give you two. Uh, yeah, you, you, you get the second one. Because <laughs> okay. All right. Um, let, let, me, let me give credit where credit is due there, though. Um, because I was blessed in that the Lord mentored me by another pastor in particular who taught me what servanthood was. And that was Pastor Lucian in Haiti. Um, and, and, and he taught me. Uh, and then Pastor Jephthah, uh, following right in his footsteps, also taught that lesson. That I, I got to see a man who was the consummate servant to everyone. And he, he puts me to shame. Uh, you, you know, he, he could honestly say in a town of uh, probably 15,000 when he said it, he could honestly say that there wasn't a single household that he had knocked on the door and shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with. That every single person, that he can go and stand before the Lord with his conscience clear because he tried to share the gospel with everyone that was in that particular scope. And so I, I was able to experience what true servanthood was in someone else and and learn the importance of that for you know in my own ministry so but um uh, and, and i think that goes double now with with us with every single one of us because that's how you learn servanthood really you you learn it by example by you you see people around you we can we can sit around all day long and talk servanthood okay the heretics are out there calling talking servanthood and they what they want is your money but they're going to talk the same talk in order to get it. So it's to, to actually see the, the difference in not just once, but the, the duration. And, and that's what, Preston, you bring up something that is so much on my heart. Um, just, just think about it. I've been talking about this, been talking Kay's ears off about it. Um, think about all of the parables that Jesus taught. And, and I wish we could get them all in a line and just line them up. How many of them are about servants and masters? How many of them, the good steward, the, the wicked steward, the, the, the minas, the, the talents, the, the, the servants, and, and over and over and over again, he uses the example of masters and servants to try and teach us what is important and what is great in the kingdom of God. Now, if a church like ours, no matter how small we are, if we are the epitome of the servant that, God is, that, that Jesus came to teach us when he became a servant, and, and, and just the humiliation, just being born in a, in, in a human body, just living in a manger, just going through all of the, uh, of the mockery and the hatred and the, and the rejection that he went through. This is God incarnate, for goodness sakes. And, and if he continued to be a servant towards the servants that his father had given him, as he said in the high priestly prayer, then he's the model for us. And, 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 and if we as a church get that, 
If we get that and it becomes real, it becomes part of us, that we are the servants of each other and of our master, then the power that we wield is not the power of just a few people. It's the power of God. You know, and, and, and so that's, that's why this is such important teaching. But, uh, just like you said, like, over the 12 years, you know, through the COVID and then people moving and everything, God is, when those people moving out, God has replenished this congregation. Right. You know, like, some leave, God is standing replenishing the congregation. Right. More people coming. Right. A lot of, most, most people that, uh, that I see now are new. Yeah. 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 So, so, yes. Imagine how much she has been here from the beginning. Yeah. How many years she? I mean, how many years of the people that are here? Yeah. How many years of the people that are here? How many years of the people that are here? How many years of the people that are here? How many years of the people that are here? How many years of the people that are here? How many years of the people that are here? How many years of the people that are here? How many years of the people that are here? How many years of the people that are here? How many years of the people that are here? How many years of the people that are here? How many years of the people that are here? How many years of the people that are here? How many years of the people that are here? How many years of the people Either that or I keep running them off. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 of the two, yeah. But uh, no, seriously, it, it's, we, that became so evident to me. Um, and with difficult years for us, it was difficult years for the Reformed Church in Broward County. But when Dr. Kennedy died and then replaced by a pastor that did not re necessarily reflect Dr. Kennedy's teachings, and we had this sort of influx of people looking for their church. Uh, a lot of people that were hurting were brought here. Now, most of them aren't here. Some of them still are. But, the, the, you know, the Lord brings the people by that he wants. And, and if you look on our website, uh, this has been, um, th this is our philosophy. What is our philosophy of church growth? To minister to everyone God brings to the front door. That's it. That's, that, that's the long and the short of it. We don't advertise. We don't get out there and tell people about us. We don't, we're not out there trying to steal people from other churches in, in any way. Even the parents of our children, we, you know, if, if there's a school function, this place is full, as you guys know. It, we, we, we don't proselytize those parents or try to get them to come to this church. It's like, hey, if you don't have a church, then you can come here. Otherwise, go to your church, right? So uh, it's, it's, that's, that's just the, 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 the model that we have, which I think is the model that we should have. A little short lady, but her, she, 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 she came from the neighborhood over there because she was visiting her son-in-law, her daughter and her son-in-law. Yes. yes. And, so, and, she, and, and she said that, oh, I was looking for the church and then I came, but it was hard to get in, but I made my way in, she, you know, with, with the gate and all. But, but see, that's God leading, yeah. you know, yeah. and he's in control of it all. I also want to ask prayer when you finish. Our, our niece, uh, two weeks ago, she, she, she took some pills and, 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 and didn't catch it in time. And, she went in the coma, and then she passed uh, a couple days ago. So, so she's 17, 17. So I would like for you to pray for it in the end. But um, it's uh, North Carolina. North Carolina, where we'll we be going. But uh, so, so uh, and yeah, yeah, it was, you know, uh, they didn't find out because when she got to the hospital, they knew that she was throwing up or whatever at home, but they didn't know they just figured she was sick, yeah. cold or something. Yeah. But then when they when, when the doctors doctor got to the doctor, the doctor she told the doctor what happened. Yeah. And, and then after that, uh, <coughs> that's when the mother found out of any event. Uh, she went into a coma at that time, and then when they put her on the, she was on the, on the and Huh? Yes, 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 they know Jesus, and I'm sure, and I'm sure, and I can't be for sure, and I'm sure that, you know, uh, she would thought she was gay or whatever like that, and so somebody put some online, you know, whatever, put it in her, and, yeah. but then, you know, it's the devil, and, and, and he, no matter what we say, he gonna do his job. 
Amen. 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 Lord, we, we, we know we don't pray for those who have already passed and um, are already either in your presence or not. You know we don't. Well, we do ask that you know, the Sinai's parents, that they would be comforted. Uh, we do pray that she did know you and that even though this is a, a, such a tragic thing, that, uh, that her, her anguish and pain would be over, that she would be with you. We have no way of knowing. But um, we pray for those who are left behind. Um, we pray for um, uh, the family that in their tremendous pain over this. And we also, Lord, lift up a, a whole bunch of other young people that are caught up in this, this evil that has permeated our schools and our young people um, that, that leads them to a time where they just can't live within themselves. Um, we do ask for your, your blessing there, that you would reveal yourself to those that are yours to steal them back from the hands of the evil one as he goes about the business that he has become so good at and he's so, the society now is so receptive to. Or we just give you the glory in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, Naomi. Um, um, we, we started off talking about... Um, numbers and how we can bring more uh, souls to Christ, but when I look at the scripture, when it talks about growth, it's talking about spiritual growth. Mm -hmm. And if we grow, um, Jesus said that we might be one, that the world might believe that he has come and that we also must love one another so that they will know that we are disciples. Mm -hmm. And he also teaches us that um, um, <coughs> that if we are the examples, be ready to give an answer to mm -hmm. every man who uh, come and ask you a vote. If we live according to the word of God and as the president had, had brought uh, forth um, that when COVID came we either people died or people moved or it was like and how the Lord replenished this church yeah. just by us being examples and just by you preaching the gospel continuously regardless of what's going on the Lord asked to the church such as should be saved. Amen. Amen. I appreciate that. And, 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 and that's, that's our philosophy. That's, that's it. In a nutshell, okay? Uh, love each other, love the people, preach the gospel, um, be ready in, in time and season to share the good news with anyone who comes through the front door, and to be examples ourselves just as Jesus was. And, and, and then, I'm telling you what, when, when, when you have a church full of people like that, it, it kind of sticks out, doesn't it? It's, uh, it, it's, it's like being a lighthouse on a, on, on a rocky shore. That's why you need to be circulating around, talking with people and finding out who they are. Yeah. 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 Because it brings people tight up. And then I, I was... When we was having it in the, in the, in the other room, oh, and then when we got back in, I said, I kind of missed it because it was tighter. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, you, you was able to. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and I had that a lot. I had a lot of people say, okay, I like the, the intimacy over there. And I've, I've said it before to a person, they were the ones who weren't breaking the room down and resetting it back up. <laughs> Okay, uh, and so it's, it's all well and good. I appreciate that, but we'll, we'll take this, okay? This is a lot easier uh, to block off those, those benches back there. Um, but no, I, I do. It's, it's like that's the reason I took the opportunity to do it is because 
you, I think we got a taste of what it's like to actually sit next to each other. And it's, it was a novel idea, wasn't it? Uh, to have that kind of relationship. So, yes, ma'am. I do want to make a comment um, because I left for several months to worship with my daughter who works at another church, finding that I, I wasn't really worshiping with her. But God showed me that I already had a family here. I mean, even though I wanted to be so much, you know, with my, in, in my immediate family, he, he just showed me and said I needed to come back. Um, and I'm so grateful for that. I mean, genuine, people here are so genuine. Yes. And, th and that's what I have found. I mean, when I got, came back and I want to cry, I mean, <laughs> the way people just approached me that they were so happy I was back. I was like, wow, then, you know, this is where God wants me to be. And I believe that the Lord will put you exactly where he wants you to be. Yes. Whatever, you know, the church he wants you to be. And, and I also came back because I love Pastor Kirby's preaching. I mean, he speaks the truth through, through God's grace. Um, he totally just always preaches the, the truth with, with expository teaching. And, and I'm just so happy I'm back. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, the... the um, I, I am blessed to have been taught that and given a, a great heart for um, the Bible. And I have to tell you where that came from. Uh, and initially it was from Kay to, um, to watch her, again, uh, seeing a model. When I'm not saved, seeing her spend hours in the Old Testament, it's like, Kay, what on earth are you doing? I mean, what are you finding there to read? You know, that, that intensely. And, and, and just a, a love for scripture that I saw in her, that when I finally came around, the Lord saved me, that love was already instilled because that was the model that I had. So, you know, to, to be able to see it in others, that's why we are so important to each other, that, 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 we, that we, we share with that. Yes, ma'am, Miss Ellen. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, I've been in a 12-step program for a long time, and in structure, anybody that has a treasure, they're all called trusted servants. And it's like a triangle with the, instead of like this, it's the other way around. The members are the most important, and then everybody else. Because you can work your way up you know, to be, I don't know, not the president, yeah. you know, a, a group representative. Um, and it's, it doesn't matter, you are called a trusted servant.
these two ladies, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, that I have a heavy responsibility with that. I, I'm a little bit stumped with this, and I keep going to the Lord and keep praying about it, and, you know, what I'm getting is to be loving. Kind to be loving. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, well, to be she... loving and kind as Jesus was loving and kind. Um, Jesus was loving and kind with a very sharp dividing line between truth and false, and between what um, I will uh, condone and not condone, or what I will turn my head and act like it's not there, and what I don't. And, and I think your attitude, without knowing it, and, and that would be a, another conversation, um, that that um, you never do wrong by standing up for the truth. And if, it, and if someone is going to be adverse to the truth, then um, I, 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 I would ask myself whether or not you're going to be effective with that person, okay? Uh, in, in other words, in, and this happens, our younger daughter Ashley's a, a consultant and she does an awful lot of consulting with people that are have the same kind of tumor that she has and uh, so she she is constantly confronted with people that say well you, you know uh, it's okay for the religious part but I'm really not interested in the religious part what I'm interested in is what you can tell me about the, what the secular world has come up with from your counseling and basically she has to say well I'm of no value to you then because you can't separate it. You can't separate my, my faith, my belief, the fact that Jesus is the cure to everything. I'm not going to be able to help you. In, in other words, uh, if, 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 I, if you ask me to separate that from what I try to help you with. Okay? So in other words, the truth is biblical truth. And the whole idea, I mean, there's some great programs out there, but they are great in the sense that they reflect biblical truth. Because that's the only truth that there really is. Just like that's the only um, uh, a wisdom that there really is, is biblical wisdom. And I would, I would definitely have that conversation. What good are you going to do in the long run? What good are you going to do in the long run if you, the, what the value that you have is the, the, the faith in Jesus Christ and what Jesus can do in a heart. And if he says, okay, I'm not interested in that, what, what can I do to help you? I, I can't. Because you're talking about something that's outside of my realm. So, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Miss Patty. On that same subject, um, our um, love life sidewalk counselors, we've had discussions on these some of these same things. Uh, and one person mentioned yesterday that sometimes it's, it's um, not said right at the beginning, but as the relationship goes, where you that they kind of trust in you because basically what I do. People, uh, Right. But if there's a relationship going, then there's more. Then you can get into these conversations. And, and, I, I, I agree with you a thousand percent of that technique. As far as, as how you deal with a particular situation. But if it comes to the point where it is said, I'm not interested in that part, I, I want to take some other thing that you have, well, you can't separate the two. You, and, you, and you really shouldn't be able to separate the two. So, yeah, you don't come up, hit them over the head with a Bible, and, and, you know, say this is the only way I want to talk to you. Obviously, you, you work into it. Yes, ma'am. And how Jesus, you know, definitely had that line. So is that the verse with the pearls? And it's, it's so hard to say because it's so, um, uh, you know, it says, do not throw your pearls to swine. Swine. Yeah. God, you know, you never, you, you never want to even say that word, but if they're rejecting the gospel and they're saying, well, I want this part, but I don't want that part. Like when I tell people that I've been healed of uh, rheumatoid arthritis, they say, I want to know everything. And I say, are you, you want to know everything? Okay, well, the very first thing I did was to be afraid of, yes, I was prayed over by the pastors and elders of the church and um, they uh, prayed healing hands over me, and then it was probably three months later that I found um, a holistic doctor who gave me a um, number of supplements uh, to take to uh, cleanse, you know, uh, um, I had a, uh, uh, a 
flood in my house and he thought maybe I had um, gotten mold into my system. So he did a mold detox and did, um, uh, you know, the uh, food sensitivity tests and all that. But they say, and then the next thing I hear is not who's your pastor, where's your church? It's like, who's that doctor? Yeah. 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 I think, but that's not, yeah. you know, I feel like almost like not even telling them that part, you know, and that telling them that, that is, is the real that, part, what that, really heals me. What you well, just is going back to the throwing your pearls before swine. That is um, uh, the, one of the reasons that we need to be pouring ourselves into the word. That, because that's discernment. That is a, that is a, you need to have spiritual discernment to recognize a swine. You know, in the beginning of that chapter, famously, Jesus says, judge not, lest ye also be judged. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you later on. I, I mean, that's all in that seventh chapter of Matthew. And then he says, don't throw your pearls before swine. Okay. So the, the, the most popular verse in the Bible is that seven, chapter 7, verse 1, judge not lest you also, will be, uh, lest you also will be judged by non-believers. That's their favorite verse, and they quote it more than any other. And uh, the, the, the classic response to that is then, well, if you're not judging someone at least in, the, in, in their lifestyle, how can you call them a swine? I mean, you're going to have to make a judgment there somehow. I mean, I, I can't decide you're a swine not worthy of pearls if I'm not at least taking your life and comparing it to the standard of Scripture. Um, so so that's, a, that's a discernment thing. You, you need to be able to have spiritual discernment to be able to know when someone is rejecting you. Now, let, let, me, let me put that in a broader context, okay? Okay. Um, in the world out there, in a general sense, make your, put yourself an unbeliever like your, your, your friend, homosexual, uh, obviously some kind of uh, uh, substance abuse, um, some kind of, uh, of an issue. And he's going to, from person to person to person to person, and he's looking for solutions, which is typically what happens, uh, bouncing around looking for a solution. Well, the one who is going to stick out, now, what do we believe? Here's this person, he's going around looking for truth. All right, what did we learn? Gosh, was that, uh, what night was that? Um, if you seek for me with you, I, I think it was New Year's Eve. If you seek for me with your whole heart, you will find me, okay? You, you will find me if you are indeed seeking for me, for the, the face of God. All right, so when, when, when you present that person with a gospel, let's just say you have two situations. You're tolerant, you're good, you're nice. You're, you're trying to sort of put a Christian spin on the doctor, okay, or the, 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 the system, you're trying to put a Christian spin on it, but you're being very politically correct by it. And, and the person is just not interested in the slightest with anything to do with religion. Hey, that's fine for you. That's all well and good. And you try several times to reach out to them with that, and they continue to say, no, it's no good. And then finally, they get mad at you, and you say, okay, I'm not going to throw my pearls before swine. You, and you... Cut them off. That's the best thing you can possibly do for them. Because now there's a chance for them because you're not alone in this world. If that's God's person, God is going to have them eventually. It may not be you, but you're going to have more to do with that person's salvation to allow them to know that they are lost and on the outside of God's plan. The worst thing you can do is to make them feel comfortable in that in-between world that people try to create for themselves. Oh, I can have a little bit of religion, and I can have a little bit of this. My God is this. My God is that. I'll put it all together, and I try to find comfort. Well, if you're so comfortable, why are you going from person to person and looking for counsel? I mean, if you're so comfortable with your life, you wouldn't be doing that. Your life's a mess. And I can tell you the truth. If you're going to reject it, then fine. I've got nothing better. I have nothing else to tell you. I can't because this is the truth. I can't water it down. And it's the best thing that you can do to somebody because that will bring them face to face with what the truth actually is. And you can be rest assured that most other people are not going to do that. Okay? Most other people are not going to do it. But you do it in love. That's the whole thing. Is to be, there's a loving way to do things. And there's a, 
nasty way. Right. Yeah, you swine. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not going to throw my pearls before you. But e even to, even to be, you know, well, you jerk, you, 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 you small-minded person. You know, leave that to me up here. Uh, uh, you, you know, because say I'll, I'll say it up here, but and it might get through to someone. But I would never say it on a one-to-one -one basis with somebody to to use that to ad hominem attack. In other words, um, but I will be straightforward with them. That if if you are going to be face to face with the truth, and you are going to reject it, I you're going to have to find somebody else because I I can't do anything but tell you that. So, any questions? Anybody have a question on the sermon? Oh, yes, ma'am, Miss Sam. I was going to have a question, but I found I really enjoy the Greek words that you yeah. bring up, and then I try to find them to write the proper spelling. So, curious, I was looking for it with a C, but it's K-Y. K-U. K-U? Yeah. Oh, well, well, actually, K-Y is curious, but I think they can spell K-U, but typically it's K-U. Um, <laughs> the, 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 the Greek letters are different than English. Some of them are very close. And I, and, I, and I do that because quite often the English words that we're used to don't tell the whole story. You know, they, they, they just don't. You, you have to get a, a deeper picture um, to put it in, into a story. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Rosanna. Why do you think it mattered to Peter who Jesus was talking to? That's a great question. Um, what was the question? Uh, why, why, did, why do I think it mattered to Peter? Who Jesus was talking about, okay? Um, now, I can postulate. I can't tell you because the scripture doesn't tell us. But there's several different ways that could be. Um, knowing Peter, it, it could easily be, surely you're not talking about us being servants, <laughs> all right? Surely you're not talking to us because we, we're the leaders, right? And we're supposed to be leading, and now you're talking about the upside-down nature of things. So are you talking about us or are you talking about everybody? Uh, okay, no, that's not very nice to Peter. Um, and I kind of fear going to heaven because uh, <laughs> I've said so many things about him and, and from the pulpit. You know, he's going to, you know, he's got an eternity to hunt me down. <laughs> um, but, well, I, actually, that's, it, I, I'm, I'm not sure Peter's going to be at the gates. I, the, the one who's at the gate that I know about is the one who's going to look into your eyes and try to determine whether he knows you, okay? Uh, that's the one who, who, who'll, be, who'll be at the gate. But, but also, I, I think that um, uh, there, there, there might have been a little bit of incredulity on Peter's part um, because Again, a very poignant picture for them, okay? What Jesus just described of a master coming home and serving his servants was radical beyond anything we can put into words to them. That was off the charts. This, you know, and, and I'm sure he knew that Jesus is talking about himself, and I'm sure he kind of figured out that Jesus is not only talking about himself, he's talking about them. Remember, Peter's the one, when, when Jesus came to wash his feet, what did he say? You're not going to wash my feet, okay? And then Jesus, of course, says, I don't wash your feet. You have nothing to do with me. Wash all of me. <laughs> That's a, that was so typical of him. But I think that, that on, on the one hand, it, it, he just struggled. And, and another thing, and now, when he asks the question, Jesus has not got to the wicked servant part yet, okay? He's just finished the, 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 the ready, ever watchful, ever alert um, servant. But I, I'm sure that in other teachings that Jesus had already made this distinction. And I'm quite certain that, that Peter was struggling with the whole concept as all Jews were, of there being Jews who weren't the people of God, who were going to be on the outside, who were going to be the one cut to pieces. Whoa, 
that's, that's it's huge. That's, that's very, I mean, that's an awful thing, and we'll get to that next week. So I think that, that Peter was surprised a, a little bit um, because you have to remember um, what, what Preston just kind of articulated as far as the way some pastors are with their congregations, that was certainly the way it was in Israel. Okay, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the chief priests, the scribes, the Levites, these were the big dogs. I mean, they are the ones, they, they were in complete control. The idea of them being servants or greatness in God's kingdom to be a servant, totally foreign to them. So they're struggling with these things. And, and what, what Jesus is saying here, and, and I, I never feel like I bring it out as well as, as the text brings it out. You know, I, I never feel that I, the, the words, I always feel that the words fail me to a degree. But the importance of what Jesus is bringing about, that greatness is servanthood, that, that the greatest virtue is to be a no-name, never appreciated, never thanked, never recognized servant for your whole life and to die thinking you're a failure. That's greatness, and that's just so completely opposite of what the, what, what the world teaches. And, and, and even for us, it's hard to understand. Can you imagine how it was for Peter? Okay, Because they're all thinking that we're in. Here's the Messiah. He's the king. We're going to be, you know, the, uh, the top dogs, right? Uh, so I think he struggled with that. So, but that's, that's, a, that's a great question. And, and I hasten to say... That's all Kirby Williams' um, assumption, because the scripture doesn't tell us. But Jesus does answer it in verse 48, and we'll get to that when we get to it. Verse 48 is basically his answer to what Peter says. And it's not whether you're a leader, disciple, apostle, or not, which one of you is a servant. Okay? And if you're a servant, much will be required of you because much has been given you. That's why this whole thing should have been taught at one time. But I don't have that gift. One, the gift that I do not have is to be able to take something as in depth as this and just brush over it, you know, to do it in a few words. I just can't do it. I, I try, you know, but I just can't do it. <laughs> well, it means, uh, it means we don't make it through our books very quickly. Okay, uh, unfortunately, yeah. Um, but again, I, I love to go and read other pastors. Uh, Martin Lloyd Jones, for instance. Uh, boy, I tell you what, you talk about a man who could take a word and turn it into a sermon. That was him. An amazing um, a mind that was. Okay, any other questions? Any other comments? Anybody else want to tell me how wonderful I am? <laughs> no, just. Just kidding, just kidding. It embarrasses me because I, 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 I know that um, I, I know that it's like Alistair Begg says, if you knew what was in my mind, you wouldn't listen to me. If I knew what was in your mind, I wouldn't preach to you. Um, and, and I feel like an imposter so much that uh, I'm, I'm glad to know that the Spirit uses the words that are His anyway and the communication. Yes, sir, Mr. Matthew. I'm just, it's more of an observation than a question, but just how much um, Jesus uses food as his examples and how we can relate to that in our carnal hungry. <laughs> yes. Now, how, how, how am I supposed to interpret that? Is that a meta message that it's lunchtime? <laughs> you are so right. And the reason is, and that's what makes Jesus such a magnificent teacher, is he could take something that every single one of us relates to, which is food, or light, or darkness, or things that, water, things that we all are, are aware of, and to turn it into a lesson, okay? And so he would, yes, he would use food quite a bit. He would use clothing um, in, in his descriptions. Um, but I'm telling you what, guys, 
go back and read the Gospels and do yourself a, a, a little bit of a deep word study. Take all of the different teachings of Jesus and line them all up and see how many of them are warning us of the consequences of sin and hell and separation from God and how many of them are saying God loves you and has a plan for your life. Line them up. You, you'll be amazed. You'd be amazed at how much time Jesus actually spends warning us about bad behavior, warning us about judgment, warning us about, uh, about not following him, not being Christ-like. It's, it's so lopsided. And yet the only thing we hear coming from pulpits these days is how much Jesus loves us, and he loves us, and it's all about love and grace. But that's not his teaching. Jesus taught Man, this is your chance. This, this, this is the truth. You either latch on to it or, or you're going to miss it. You miss your time of visitation. So heavy, he, he, heavy stuff there as far as the Gospels were concerned. Yes, sir, but they do. he does talk a lot about food. And with that said, and knowing that Matthew is still a growing boy, <laughs> um, I think that we should probably pray and let him go eat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry, I have to tell this story. I have to tell this story. When we would go to Haiti, uh, really, the way I met Matthew was that he was our interpreter in the early days of taking teams. Kay and I would take teams from um, the school over at Westminster, and sometimes we'd have 35, 40 kids, you know, that we would take, and Matthew was our, 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 our translator, would go with us everywhere. Um, but we would eat, you know, they would feed us uh, uh, just what they ate, uh, Haitian food. And we had this big long table and everybody would sit down and Matthew would sit at the end of it. And then when everybody finished, everything they could eat, they would give the rest to Matthew. <laughs> and Matthew would clean the plates. <laughs> he, he, he has a world-class appetite. <laughs> oh, but we had great times in those days, didn't we? Those, those were blessed days, for sure. So with that in our hearts, let's, uh, let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing. Father, we are, so, we are so blessed that you have given us so many things. You've given us your son. You've given us salvation. You've given us a place in heaven. You've given us righteousness that none of us deserve. And you've given us yourself, which is the greatest gift of all. But you've also given us each other. You've given us fellowship. You've given us relationship. You've given us shoulders to cry on, people who need to be helped. You've, you've given us those who will hold us accountable in our times of weakness, those who will pray for us when we need praying. You were so wise. You knew all of this when you established the church, when you established the, the method uh, or, or the organization that would take your word forward into the world. And we know that the, the enemy has tried since the beginning to destroy the church, and you said it would never be destroyed, and it never has. And that there's small groups of people. There's a lot of heresy in the church. We know that. There's a lot of hypocrisy within the church. We know that, too. But also, there are faithful churches, and we are faithful not only, not at, at all because of ourselves. Not, nothing. We, we have no more merit in our faithfulness than we do in our salvation. But you have set aside for yourself small groups, and Lord, we pray that we are one of those groups, and that we would be blessed to be the kind of church that you want us to be, and that in that we would be the servants that you were when you came. We would be your servants, and we would be servants to each other. And therefore, be the, be the kind of church that is needed right here, right now in this place. We will give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, and God bless you all. God bless you.